about Christ praying that the Father will glorify Him. Okay, he was going... Now, this is his prayer just before he would be captured. Remember, all right? So, um, Elim, when did this happen? The Lord Jesus was praying. So, Elim and everyone, if you're there, then you're hearing the Lord Jesus pray, all right? And this was the time just before Judas would bring the wicked man to catch Jesus, all right? So, this is his last time that he prayed that the disciples can hear him pray <coughs> audibly. Now, I ask you this question. Um, okay, uh, maybe Emily. Emily, do you know what your mom and dad talks about you and your sister when they are, when they are alone? Maybe in their bedroom. At night, they're lying in bed and they're talking about um, um, you and your sister. All right? Jesslyn, do you know what they wish for you? What they talk, to you, talk about you? Very often not. You may not know, right? But if it were to happen to pass the room, then you hear them talking. And then they say, oh, you know, Jesslyn, you know, I wish this about Jesslyn. And Emily, I hope this for Emily. Um, or Brenda, the same. Or anyone else. Joshua. Vincent, uh, Vincent, your parents are not believers. Right? Your believing parents, Caleb, Cornelius, Jennifer, Veronica. Then your, your parents are talking. How, what they wish in their heart, deep in their heart, what they hope for you. What would, what would, would you be interested? You'd be interested, right? Or you say, ah, I can't be bothered. If you say can't be bothered, means you don't love your daddy and mommy, you don't care what they think, right? Now, here is the Lord Jesus praying for us. And he recorded it us, recorded it here so that we know, we know what he desire for us. So Ellery, when you read this, every time each one of us read this, Joanne, Joanna, Joanne, Joanne. This is really what God is saying. I am praying for Joanne. I am praying for Ellery. I am praying for Kenny, for Julia. Cheryl, I am praying for you. And we cannot not bother and not be interested. Okay? So now at the end of this, um, hey, what are you drawing? <laughs> you're, not suppo you're supposed to pay attention. Now this is what Jesus prayed, alright? You're supposed to write what, what Jesus prayed about. Okay? So Chloe, now at the end of it, I'm going to ask you, what did Jesus pray for Chloe? Okay? So you must pay attention. What did Jesus pray for Chloe? Now, let's, let's look. Now, first of all, just very quick revision. Um, 1 to 5, Christ prayed for him, for himself. Now, let's read verse, um, verse 4 and 5 together. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. So we must be interested in Christ's glory. Christ said, Father, glorify me. So we also must be interested in glorifying God, Christ himself, all right? So that, that is one lesson that we learned. Now, verses 6 to 18, we learned a few things, just a quick revision. Now, one of the things that is very clear here, did, was Jesus praying for everyone in the world? No, he was not. Look at verse 9, I pray for them, I pray not for the world. So Christ was not praying for everyone in the world. Christ was specifically praying for believers. Remember that, okay? Remember that. And um, what is one of the things that he prayed for the believers? Well, the believers then, same for us today. All right, believers then, same for us today. Um, anyone remembers? Ignatius, what did Christ pray for the believers then? What is one of the things? Okay, all quickly look at your Bibles, huh? because I'm going to ask you. You must be interested what Christ prayed for. What did Daddy and Mommy wanted for me? Say again. Okay, very good. Verse 15. Now let's read verse 15 together. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but thou shouldest keep them from the evil. Now, this is the beginning of a very detailed prayer. Christ said, so do you know 
Cheryl, that this is what Christ prayed for you. Christ prayed that don't take Cheryl out of this world. <laughs> Leave Cheryl in the world. Leave Emily, Emily after your eh, Emily. Leave uh, Jennifer after your born Christ. Say, Leave Jennifer in this world. All right, that is his will. And he said, for this group, I don't want them to die yet. And what do they want? Keep them from the evil. Keep them from Satan. Keep them from sin. What else? So that's one thing. What else? Um, uh, um, Emily or Jocelyn. What else did he pray for them? Um, Very good. Verse 17. Let's read together. This is the next thing. This is what Christ prayed and wants for us. Let's read verse 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So the next thing. Um, Chloe, Elim, what is sanctify? Sanctify means make holy. Make you holy. You know what is holy? Holy means don't sin. Alright? Don't commit sin. Okay? So Christ, when you say sanctify, what is sanctify? Be holy. Very good. Be holy. Now, God wants us to be holy. That is what He prays for. So you just think. Um, now, I wonder what Jesus wants for me. Just like you wonder what daddy and mommy hopes for you when you grow up. Ellery, what is it? Sanctification. God wants sanctification. That is what he prayed for us. Um, okay, so those are the two things we studied so far. And when for today, for today, verse 20 to 26, 20 to 26, what seems to be one now, actually, that is not the only thing that Christ prayed for the believers then. Actually, you look at verse, um, verse 11. What is another thing? Verse 11. Um, uh, Julia. That they may be one. Notice, verse 11, that the disciples would be one. Just like Christ and the Father are one. So, oneness, unity, unity. Now, for the future believers, for us, all those things that Christ prayed for them applies to us. Remember? Understand? It applies to us also. And then he prays something for, the, for us again also. What do you think it is? Verse 20 to 26. Veronica, what do you think it is? There's one word, there's something that keeps repeating. Cornelius. Something that he keeps repeating. Joash. That they may be one. Right? You see, he prays again and again. Now look at verse 21. That they may be one. Now you look at verse 22. That they may be one. And then, um, yeah, so now the Lord keeps praying that we would be one. Okay, we would be one. Now, we are going to look at more of this afterwards. I just want you to have an overview first. <clears throat> but at this point, we focus on one thing. Now, Christ, uh, this was where we stopped last previous week, and then we continue. Now, what was the key thing from the Father that Jesus gave to believers? Question number one. Okay, Chloe, Elim, look at question number one. Chloe, you have question number one. All right, what was the key thing from the Father that Jesus gave to believers? We read the prayer. Um, what is it? Joshua. Okay, verse 8. Now, he says, For I have given unto them the words which thou givest me. God the Father gave him the word, and Christ said, I gave to the people. Now, how do you know this is one thing that Christ wants to emphasize? Joshua. Hmm? The words, correct. But later on, later on, anyone spot it, Cheryl? What's that? 
Anyone? Now notice that in verse 14, he says it again. He says it again. I have given them thy word. Christ keeps saying, I have given them thy word. I have given them thy word. I have given them thy word. In Christ's prayer, he keeps telling God the Father, what, what the words you give me, the word I have given to them. Okay? This is one thing that is very much on Christ's heart. God wants to make sure that you receive God's word. Understand that? So, Chloe, what is the one thing that Christ keeps telling God the Father? I've given to Chloe. I've given to Chloe. What is it? The word. The Bible. The word of God. Okay? The word. So, Jesus says, I've given the word. Now, why is giving the word so crucial? Why? For both times, he cited the reasons. The first time when he said, I've given them thy word. What was it about? Verse 6. Look at verse 6, the context. I have manifested thy name. I made known your name. Verse 7. Now they know everything comes from you. Verse 8. I've given them your, your word. What is he saying? Now, notice that in verse 6, he begins by saying, I have manifested thy name. I have made known your name. How? I give them your word. Now, there is something that is very deep in Jesus' heart in this prayer. Let me ask um, uh, let me ask you. Jennifer, how does the Lord end this prayer? How does the Lord end this prayer? Which is the end of the prayer? Verse what? 26, good. How does he end? I have declared thy name. You notice that when he starts to pray about the disciples, he begins in verse 6, I have manifested thy name. And he ends this prayer in verse 26, I have declared unto them thy name. Christ wanted people to know God's name. Mm -hmm. And he made sure that through that, how? Through giving the word, all right? Through giving the word. Now, Ellery, what does it mean to know God's name? Any ideas? I, say, I, I make sure they know your name. They say, oh, we know God's, God the Father's name. What is the name? Know his word. Know his word? It, through his word, they will know his name. But do you remember Jesus said, the Father's name is something? Not really. What does it mean? Cheryl, what do you think? What, because Christ said, I make sure they know your name. I give them their, the, your word so that they know your name. What is knowing God's name? Yes. Say again. Knowing God's word, yes. Knowing God's word, we'll know his name. Vincent, what does it mean to know God's name? Actually, I covered all this with you all, but it's so long ago. What does it mean to know God's name? Knowing who God is. Very good. Why do you say that? Because uh, to make known his word to them, to be made known. What is God's name? Uh, God's character. God's character. All right? They say, I want them to know you, your character, who you are, what you have done, everything about you. When you say, I want to know someone's name, or what is my name back then, it reflects who he is, what he is, what he does. Understand that? Now, Christ said, I give them... Now, how do you know God? How would you want to know... How can you know God? Who God is? What is his character? Elim. The only way is through what? Dreaming. No, right? Dangerous, right? Dreaming is dangerous. You imagine. So how to know God? Read the Bible. Read the Bible, alright? So now, what is Christ saying? Christ is saying, it is so important. I give them your word. I give them your word. Why does God, why did Christ say, I give them your word? So that the world, that the believers and the world will know who you are. Now, I'm not saying all this for fun, huh? because at the end, I'm going to ask you about this prayer. The deep desire in Christ's heart, even when he prayed for the disciples, I made known your name. He begins that in their prayer, he ends the prayer with that. I've made many I have declared unto them your, thy name. Jennifer, what is the thing that Christ wants the disciples to know very much? 
about God. About God. Okay, now understand that first. <clears throat> so I ask you this question. Why, what was the key thing that God the Father gave to Jesus? The Word. Right? The Word. And why is it so important for believers? Because it is only through the Word that you are going to know God. You are going to know His heart. You are going to know what He desires of you. Do you care what desire, God desires of you? We cannot not care. Elim uh, and Chloe, do you, do you bother what your mommy and daddy wants you to be when you grow up? Of course, right? It's important. Now this prayer is what Jesus wants us to be, so you must pay attention. So number one, why is it so important to believers? Because it causes us to know. Now, we can imagine who God is. I think many of us imagine who God is. Many of us make up our mind, even Christians. Now, God is not praying for unbelievers, right? Cornelius, who is God praying for? The believers. But yet Christ said, I want the believers to know you, God. He said, but as believers, we know him. I'm afraid not so. I think many of us have our own image of God. We live our lives, we commit sin, and we think that God is okay with it. We live worldly lives. We say we just go to church. We, we think that God is like that. Uh, as long as I go to church, I do something for church, then for the rest of the seven, six days, I just live and sin and do whatever I want. I think God is fine with that. In fact, I think that is what God wants me to do. That is what God saves me for. Hmm? We make up our own concepts of God. The only way for you and I that we can live lives that will be pleasing to God. Why does God say, I want them to know you? Because I want them to be sanctified, right? I want them to be sanctified. I want them to be holy. And the, way you, the only way you can be holy is to know God's word. Elim, the only way you can be holy is to know God's word. Many of us don't come for Bible study regularly, don't come to, I don't read your Bible regularly, don't listen to sermons, don't study. You may be saved, you may be a believer, but that is not what God wants it to be. God says, I give them your word. I want them to know you. That is what God wants. It's like, Jesseline overhears the mommy says, or the daddy says, you know, I really want Jesseline to eat. What do you like to eat? Oh, wait, you don't like to eat broccoli. You don't like cheese. <laughs> All right. You know, Jesseline has, has weak bones. And I really want Jesseline to drink more milk and eat more cheese. All right? Now, God says, I really want that for my child. I really want them to have your word. I give it to them. I want them to know you. It's for their good is so that they will be holy, so that Jaslyn will have strong bones. That is the desire. So that is for the believer. Now, you know, over time, there are many who came to our church. Um, students, they came, and then very soon, they leave. Or some, they come, and then they say, oh, you mean Christians should not marry unbelievers? I never heard before. Right, Ignatius? You never heard it before, right? Before you came? Have you? No. Many have not heard. And then um, some, they marry unbelievers without knowing. They don't read, they don't, they don't study, they don't know. Some, they say, I, I didn't know it is wrong for, um, for mothers to work when we have babies. I didn't know, I never heard of that before. I never studied God's word. And because they worked and then they didn't look after the child, there many problems. Or some didn't know it's wrong to divorce. And then they don't know God's word, they divorced. Instead of reconciling and then many problems in life. When we don't know God's word, we cannot be holy. Understand that? God's word tells us how to live. Which is why we keep having Bible studies. Which is why we keep telling you to read your Bible at home. When you read, you begin to, oh, I didn't know. Then you begin to be holy. That is how you be holy. So that's why it's so important to believers. But I think the problem with Christians today is we know so little of God's word 
and then we go ahead and live in the world so dangerous we commit all sorts of sins okay so it's for the believers now why is it important for the church and christendom why do you think so now i want to start writing god prays that we will be god will um god prays for god prays that they will he will we will be sanctified sanctify us right sanctify now then this is about holy be holy then now this is then the next one he prayed for what unity very good Yilin, very good pray for unity right he prayed for unity now when he prayed for unity remember he said give them i give them the word the word is very important for sanctification to live a holy life you know little you will commit all sorts of sins you fall into all sorts of sins now why is the word why did god say i give them your word very important for unity why is it so important for unity those who attended previously should remember Joash, why is the word of god so important for the unity yes so you know right right what is right what is wrong so when something happens in christianity for example now we know god's word is tongue speaking still for today no right we know what is right we understand why then when um when you know they say oh that is wrong then i don't do it then will the church be united the church be united will christianity be united christianity will be united correct but today people base their unity on experience right yeah, i can speak in tongues what oh that day i dream you know i dreamt that jesus told me this but even if it's against god's word it doesn't matter because my dream matters more so only when we go back to the bible then we say what is right what is wrong then we have unity unity must be based on what truth vincent unity must be based on truth so that's why the word is very important for unity so why is the word very important for christendom and for the church because it is the basis upon which we unite so the answer to um, chloe why is the bible so important for the church because we are united based on the bible right based on the bible not based on anything that anyone wants to say okay must be based on the bible understand based on the bible so that is very important um christendom the same okay so so these are the two things that why christ say i give them your word i give them your word i give them your word if you don't bother about the word it'll be a problem if the church don't keep teaching the word and teaching it rightly there will be problems false unity now <clears throat> i want to say i want to draw this now to help you understand this prayer i was trying to figure out how to make you clear about this prayer um, christ prayed for the believers correct christ prayed for the believers so i draw the circle as believers now and these are the believers and this now he prays for unity so he wants believers to be united united okay united believers and um what is the meaning of sanctify do you remember i forgot um yes what is sanctify holy very good holy all right very good now holy but the root word i always say the root word cornelius do you remember the root word means no anyone julia set, set apart all right set apart the word sanctify it means set apart now in order for you to be holy you need to be set apart from sin correct set apart from ungodly things so set apart now god wants believers to be set apart from sin sinful things god wants believers to be set apart from false teachings correct now this was christ's prayer christ says sanctify them in other words christ says set please know believer christ's prayer for you is christ wants you to be set apart christ wants you to be set apart from sin christ wants you to be set apart from false teachings understand that now then there is another color 
Now that is sin and false teachings. Sin and false teachings. So Christ wants us to be set apart. Christ do not want us to mix. Understand? To be mixed. To be affected by sin or false teaching. So Christ is praying for, for this. For this group. This is what Christ desires. Believers to be united and set apart from sin. Okay? Now, then you look at the Bible. I'm trying to explain to you what Christ is praying. Now, look further down. Look at verse um, 20, 20. Neither pray I for this alone, not just for those that are standing in front of him, but for them also which believe on me through their word. So he say in the future, as the apostles preach, as those people preach the gospel, then others will believe. The future generation. Understand that? The future generation will believe. Then he said, I pray for this also. Verse 21, that they all may be one. That they all may be one. Verse 21, that they also may be one in us. Okay, then verse 22, that they may be one. Now, Christ wants us to be one. And Christ is praying for this group of people that are one. Where are this group of people? Who is Christ praying for? Christ is praying for this group of people. And Christ desire for Christians to be in this group. Understand that? Now, why I'm explaining this is this. As I said the other week, many take this prayer as Christ is praying for unity of what? The whole world. Unity of the whole world. Is it true? Many of the new evangelicals, charismatics, they say, hey, your church separate, your church um, practice separation, your church don't join this, don't join that, and say this is wrong, and say that is wrong. No, don't you know that Christ prayed that they may all be one? Look at your Bible. So they will quote to you, verse 21. See, Christ pray, no? The future believers, that they all may be one. What's wrong with you? Don't you understand English? That they all may be one. Who is this all? Who is this all? This all is those that he prayed for that have been sanctified and set apart. Do you understand this? Who is Christ praying for? Christ is not praying that we now go and mix with Roman Catholics, with uh, with. Um, with new evangelicals, with liberals, with charismatics. God said, no, I'm not praying for them. I'm praying for the all that are sanctified. Which happens first? Which did, she, which did he pray first? He prayed for sanctification first, right? Look at verse 17. Sanctify them. Through what? Through truth. That's why the truth is very important. And after he said, set them apart, now, after you set them apart, Father, I pray that all these ones that have been set apart, I pray for these ones. Understand? This is who Christ is praying for. And this is what Christ is praying for. The unity in here. The unity stay in here. In other words, Christ is saying, I pray that they don't get mixed up. <laughs> they stay very united here. Father, don't let them get mixed with this group. Make them one big united lump here. Understand that? That is what Christ is praying. So, when someone says, Oh, your church, or you, when you, do, when you practice biblical separation, now they don't care about this part, then you are disobeying Christ's prayer. Is that true? No. Christ, in fact, said, Please stay here. Please stay here. Please stay here. Please don't end up disunited and move here. Those that move here, is breaking the unity. Understand that? Those that are here, they are the ones that are going against what Christ is praying. I want to say this again. Who are the ones that are going against Christ's prayer that let them be one? This group. Understand that? They are the ones that are going against. When Christ said, I pray that they will be one. They will stick to this group. 
the sanctified group. When we, when those that say we, we must compromise, they are the ones that are going against this. Understand? Now, remember in the beginning, I say, Jennifer, what is Christ's deep heart desire? He began and he ended in his prayer for the disciples. He, he prayed for one thing. What was it? Is it again? Cannot hear. That they will know God. That, that they will know God. That they will know God, right? That's Christ's high priestly prayer. In fact, I'll, 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 I'll show you why. I want you to understand this prayer. Now, look at verse, verse 20. Uh, verse 21. Now, let me ask you, uh, so you, pay, you answer this question. Why does Christ want us to be one? Verse 21. Let's read verse 21. That they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, one, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Now, the next one. Um, why does he want us to be one? Let's verse, read verse 23. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and the world may know that thou hast sent me, and thou hast loved them, and thou hast loved me. So, why does Christ want us to be one? Uh, the other thing, sister, I, I forgot your name now. And, yes, Brenda, why I keep thinking of A? Hey, yes, Brenda, why does Christ want us? I keep seeing, seeing sisters. Uh, Brenda, why does Christ want us to be one? Uh, that the world may believe. Very good. That the world may know that Christ was sent by the Father. Now, why does, why does Christ want the world to know that He was sent by the Father? Brenda. Why? So you answered the first part correct. Now, uh, listen carefully. Christ wants people to know the Father, right? Then he, but in this prayer, He said that they will know that you sent me. How does, why does He want people to know that the Father sent Him? How is it linked to knowing the Father? Think carefully. Elevate. It has to do with salvation. What do you mean? Through Christ, then they get saved, then they know the Father. Yes, correct. Yes, that's one of the reasons. But why, why Christ said that they know that you have sent me? Why this prayer? Now we want to really understand Christ's heart when he prayed this. Joshua. Verse 3, but thy be the enemy of God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Okay, so verse 3. This is Christ's desire. That verse 3, that they may know thee and the know thee the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. He keeps talking about Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. How is it linked to knowing the Father? Vincent, last one, then I'll tell you your answer. Verse 23. Um, but about sending, about sending. What did Christ give to the disciples and the world? The word, correct? Christ gave the word. So Christ say, the Father sent me. I'm telling you, I'm giving you God's word. I'm telling you this. The Father sent me. If they believe that Jesus is sent by the Father, means they believe what? Jesus is God. Means they believe everything that Jesus say. If they believe that God the Father sent him, then they will believe that Jesus is God. God's Son, right? And they would therefore believe everything that God's Son, who is God, says. Understand that? Now, why do I explain this to you? <clears throat> now, listen carefully. You have to understand what Christ is praying. Christ is saying, I want Christianity to be very united, separate from sin and separate from false teaching, correct? 
Why I want them to be like that? Because I want them to know the Father, correct? I want them to know God. I want them to know who God is and what God wants. Now, if the world, now if we come here, if we come here, it means the opposite is true. Will the world know the Father? No. Will the world know the truth? No. Will Christians live rightly? No. What I'm trying to make sure we understand, look at verse 21. Look at verse 21. That they may all be one. Why Christ said it's so important that they're united here. That they're united here, then they w- the truth will remain. Understand? The moment we compromise, the truth is lost. When the truth is lost, can the world know the Father? They will know a false father. They will know a false Christianity. They will live a false Christian walk. Do you understand why Christ prayed for unity now, Vincent? Christ prayed for this tight unity and don't let this unity be mixed with anything else. Why biblical separation? Why this separation is so important? It is this. When we don't ensure that we stay united on the truth, the truth will be lost. If we don't practice biblical separation, the truth will be lost. Big deal. So what? Then man will not know the Father. Man will have a false Christianity, which is today. Now, why do I spend time to explain this? Because you must be very convicted in your heart. Why? Christ is not praying for unity with all. I hope none of you wonder, should we go to BPCWA? Oh yeah, they teach biblical separation. They teach, they so focus on the word. They say, yeah, you shouldn't go to um, this kind of church, you shouldn't go to the kind of church that are teaching charismatic things and, and practices. Maybe, we, maybe this church is just too strict. Do you understand why this is so crucial? So give me the answer. Brenda, why is, why is this unity, truth, tightly don't compromise with the rest of the falsehood? Why is it so important? What's the bottom line reason? So that people know that, very good. Why do you say the truth? Because of verse what? Verse 3. Let's read verse 3 together. And this is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. They must know the only true God. There are many false God, false Christ, false, false understanding of Christianity today. That's why Christ said the unity is so important. The separation from untruth is so important that they will know you. And this is life eternal. This is eternal life. It can affect salvation. It can affect how you live. Okay, so now this is why Christ prayed for unity. Last, I repeat again. Is Christ praying for the unity of the whole world? All the religions of the world? No. Is Christ praying that hey, BPCWA, don't, don't be so disunited. Go and unite with the charismatic movement, the ecumenical movement, the Roman Catholic. Go and unite with them. No. Christ is saying, stick together. Stay there. Be united there. This is who he's praying for. I hope you understand very clearly biblical separation and this unity concept now. This is what Christ is praying. Nothing else. Can't be further from the truth when people say Christ is praying for unity of the world. Okay, now I want you to look at verse 21. Now, if we are not united in this black area, the world may not believe. Verse 23. If we are not united in this black area and stay there, then the world may not know. Understand that? That is the danger. Okay, so now, we understand the Lord's Prayer as an overall. I want to now then move on to the next part. Now, I ask you this question. From verse 7, question number 2, from verses 15 to 18. Why does God not take all believers to heaven immediately? 
Hey, the disciples are safe already. Look at verse 15. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but thou should keep them from the evil, from the evil one. See, so God said, don't take them out of the world. So here's the world. Pay attention. He, this is the world. God says, don't take them out of the world. Alright, so this is like you're overhearing your daddy and mommy's conversation. Hmm, I don't want Jesseline and Emberly to, to leave this world. But I want them to stick to this group. Alright? God says, I don't want to, God don't take them out of this world. But he's not saying then go and live like the world. Say, I want them to be like this group. In this group. In this group. Sanctify them. Separate them. Use your word. If you don't know God's word, you will mix. You will mix. You will fall to the other side. So why does God not take you out of this world, Emily? Do you want to go? Emily, do you want to die tonight? You don't want to. Why? Okay, may I ask the other question? Emily, do you want to go to San Francisco tomorrow? No. <laughs> so, what, where do you like? What's your favorite holiday spot? Oh, uh, uh, where? Where? Japan. Japan. I was going to say Japan. I thought Brenda liked Japan. All right, Brenda, Emily, would you all like to go to Japan tomorrow? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so if I ask you, would you like to die tonight? Why do you say no? Why? Um, because we have a purpose. Because we have a purpose here. Very good answer. Not because I'm afraid of dying. <laughs> right? Because we have a purpose. Now God says, I don't want to leave because I have a purpose for them. But actually, why I ask you, why do you want to go to Disneyland tomorrow? Now, if someone asks me, do I want to die tonight? I say yes, because I really want to go to heaven. I think it's going to be a lot nicer than Japan. I love Japan. But it's going to be nicer. Oh, yes, yes, tonight. Can or not? <laughs> but, Emily is right. But if it is not God's will, then we must know, no, I don't want to die tomorrow. I don't want to run or escape from this world. Why do you want to go to Japan tomorrow? So that I don't have to go to school. <laughs> and do homework, right? No, I said, no, because there is work to be done. We don't want to die because I still have work to do. Now, Christ, do you understand why? Okay, Joanne, when you, if you are a true believer now and you die now, will you go to heaven immediately? Yes, right? Yes. Does God the Father love you very much? Very much. Ignatius, if God the Father loves you very much, this world is full of suffering, right? Why don't God the Father, okay, a great um, Ignatius came to Perth, he got saved, okay, now I take him to heaven, because heaven is a nicer place, right? Heaven is a nicer place. Why does God leave you behind? He has purpose for you to fulfill. There are things to do. So, the point is this. When Christ say, God... Father, don't take them out of this world yet because there are two, there are many things they are to do for the kingdom of God, for me, for you. When you understand that, then you have to ask yourself, Chloe, why does Jesus, why does Jesus not take you to heaven immediately? Because Jesus wants you to stay on this earth to serve him. Now, when you understand that, then you have to ask yourself, am I fulfilling that purpose? Am I fulfilling that purpose? So, Emily doesn't want to go to heaven yet. Because you say, because there's work to be done. Then you have to ask yourself, mm, but then am I really doing the work? I don't want to go to this place or that place. Am I then fulfilling my role? God says, no, no, no. They are ready to go to heaven. But don't take them yet. Don't take them yet. So, Ellery, what are you living for? You say, oh, I'm living for the reason why I'm not dead. The reason why I'm not dead is because God has things for me to do. But the question is, am I living for Him? Or am I living for self? God has things for me to do. Ellery, do you know that um, or everyone, if you're a believer, true believer, you, you cannot die. You cannot die as long as God still has work for you to do. 
you're immortal. You won't die. So even someone plot to kill you tonight, as long as God has, God says, no father, don't take Cornelius out of this world, don't take um, Vincent out of this world, you will not die, no matter how they plot and plan. But the very sad thing is, we are not living for God. Okay? We are not living for God. We are, not, we are alive, but we are not fulfilling the reason why God says, leave them in this world. But God keeps giving us chance, you know. God says, alright, they've, they've learned tonight. They have understood my prayer tonight. Brenda has understood my prayer tonight. Cheryl has understood my prayer tonight. Elaine has understood my prayer tonight. Jennifer has understood my prayer tonight. Now I hope that they will change their life. It's just like you heard your mommy say in bed, or your daddy say in bed. You know, I really wish that Jesseline would do this, or Ellery would, or not Ellery, your parents are not believers, right? <coughs> or Jennifer or Veronica would do that. Then you hurt already, then they say, hmm, if that is in my daddy's heart, then I think from now onwards I got to go and do that. This is what it is. God said, now they know my prayer. Why do you think God purposely prayed aloud for them to hear? God prayed aloud for them to hear so that they will know. So you know why your daddy and mommy purposely talk very loudly in the bedroom? <laughs> for you to hear. They said, oh, okay, that is what they want. I shall leave it. I shall change my life from tonight. <clears throat> you've gone to camp. You've heard God's word. Very often after camp, we're all revived. They say, I want to live for God. I want to obey God. But very soon, we falter again, right? But I say, let this not happen anymore because now I understand. God says, Father, don't take so-and-so, don't take Ellery out of this world yet. But as long as we don't live for him, God keeps giving us chance, you know. You know why God keeps giving us chance? Emily again, why don't you want to go to heaven tonight? Because you know that God actually has a purpose for you. He said, have I fulfilled that purpose yet? If I haven't fulfilled that purpose, I don't want to go to heaven yet, right? I don't want to go there and regret, correct? So I want to go and do it first. I want to obey God. I want to live a life that is pure and holy. I want to do that first before God take me to heaven, right? Okay, so now God gave us many chances. Don't, after camp, I'm revived. Then after a few weeks, we go back to our old life. That's not the life that God wanted you to have in this world. Okay? So now next. So you understand? Now, what was Christ's life like being sent of the Father? Um, verse 18. Let's read verse 18. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. So Christ said, don't take them out of this world. Christ said, uh, Father, as you have sent me into this world, I'm sending Emberly, Jasmine, Cheryl, Joshua, Ellery, whoever. I'm sending all this into the world, just like the way you sent me. Okay? So you now you know. How am I supposed, how is my life supposed to be on this earth? Veronica, how is my life supposed to be on this earth if God doesn't take me home? It will be the as God the Father sent Jesus. Okay? So now you look at my life. Look at your life. Mm. Okay, God left me in this world. How to draw? I don't know. Blue color. Alright, this is you. This is you. Good. I stick united with truth and I keep myself from sin. Good, very good. Now, this is you. How is my life supposed to be like in this world? Christ say, as you have sent me, I'm sending them. So how is your life on this earth? It's going to be the same as how Christ's life was on this earth. Because it's sending you the same thing, the same way. Okay? Then you have to ask yourself, am I fulfilling God's purpose? Am I living as God wants me to do in His Word on this earth? Number one. Number two is, is my life like how Jesus' life was on earth? Did Christ send Jesus... Okay, Chloe. Did Christ Jesus send Jesus to go to Disneyland in this world? Every day go and play in Disneyland? No, did Christ send Elim? Did Christ send Jesus to um, every day go play badminton, go play football, and don't do and then that's it? And uh, did did he? No. 
Now, if our life is just a life of sinfulness, did, Christ, did God the Father send Christ to spend four or five hours a night serving, surfing the internet mindlessly, playing computer games? Did God the Father send Jesus to that kind of life? Cornelius, no, right? Then if our life is one that is characterized like the world, like this side, then we overheard this prayer, we know what is in Christ's heart, but we don't care. Now you know, oh, Christ sent me, then my life must be how Jesus spent his life on earth, right? What, how he spent his time. What was his purpose in life? What did he pursue? Uh, Elim, is your life like Jesus' life on earth? No. But from this prayer, you know, okay, you look, you look, look at verse 18. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. So Jesus sent you into the world to live in this world. Then he said, just like God the Father sent him, he's sending Elim the same way. So Elim's life must be like whose life? Like Jesus' life. So you go back and check. How am I spending my time, my money? What is my life plan and purpose and ambition? What was Christ's ambition in this life? My meat is to eat Indian food. My meat is to do what? Do the Father's will. That's all. Now, if, you, if you're aiming, I want to get all A's so that I will be top in school, then I will get a scholarship, then I will go to um, the United Kingdom and study in the best university and the scholarship, then I'll come back, then I'll be very famous, then I'll be the top this, top that. Did, Christ, did God the Father send Christ to achieve all those things? Now, those things in life is, is well, if God gives it to you, God gives it to you. We must study hard, huh? we must work hard, we must do our best as a testimony to God. But when... That is your pursuit until you don't come to church. You don't study God's word. You mix with the wrong friends. Then you cannot say that my life is as the Father sent Jesus. We cannot say that. This is God's deep desire. Now the next thing. So what is your purpose of your life then? 2C. What is the purpose of your life, Elim? Now you write the answer. Answer to number 2C. The purpose of my life... Okay, I ask you, what's the purpose of your life? Elaine, what's the purpose of your life then? To do God's work. Very good. To do God's work. Christ the Father sent... God the Father sent Christ to do God's work. What work are you doing? Whose work are you doing? Your own... Was Christ rich? No. But are there rich Christians in the Bible? Yes. Alright? Nothing wrong with riches. But it's when we love money. That's the problem. When we love money. Caleb, is it wrong to be rich? What, what is wrong with money? When, we, when it becomes an idol. Alright? means we love it. Then, then money becomes evil to us. Alright? Is money useful? Can be used for missionary work, can be used for church work, right? Hmm. So now what is the purpose of life? To do God's work. If doing God's work, if I live a Christian life and I'm successful in life, so then fine. If I live a Christian life and I'm, I'm poor as a result, then fine. As long as I'm doing God's work. Okay? Um, Joash, you always ask me this question. So is it, can I... Can I do yoga? My teacher wants me to do yoga. Then my teacher wants me to do that, want to do this. Then I say, if you don't do it, what will happen? My teacher will give me a hard time. Maybe she will purposely make my grades not so good. Hmm? So now you learn. What did Christ send you to this world to do? To get good grades. So do yoga and get good grades. No, to obey Him. That's all. Right? But actually, I tell you this. The reality is this. God says, you honor me, I will honor you. 
I tell you, most of the very capable, successful people are people that are good Christians that live for God. Very often. Because God will honour them. <coughs> Emily, why would God make you successful? What's the purpose of God making you successful? Maybe you grow up and become a very, very successful person. Why did God make you successful? Hmm. Not Emily, Brenda. <laughs> why do you keep thinking of A to Brenda? Dunno. Say again? His will. Why would God choose to make you successful in His will? Julia, why? Or ask the men, Kenny. Very good. Our successes also to serve Him. Understand? Why does God make us capable, successful? Yeah, His will. But His will is that we use it to do His work. It's always for Him. It's always for Him. Now, maybe you become a very high-level manager. So, wow, God made me a very high-level, capable manager. Okay? Why? Why? Jesslyn, why? God made you an extremely um, famous pianist. How? Through your testimony. To whom? To the world. Now, sometimes if God made you very, very successful, but in that group of people, those are people who maybe they won't hear the gospel. They won't get to hear the gospel. But because you are in that group, the elite group, then hey, I got a chance to preach the gospel to them. Right? If not, don't reach them. So Ignatius, why did God make, what, if one day God say, Oh Ignatius, sorry, my will for you is to be taxi driver. Will you feel sad? Why? He will sustain you. It's not about us anymore. Remember? The prayer is, what was Christ's prayer for? Look at verse 6. I have manifested thy name. Look at verse 26. I have declared unto them thy name. Whatever Christ did on earth, whether he was rich, not rich, you know, all was for one purpose, to declare to man who God is, correct? That's all. So if you're a taxi driver, should you be sad? No, because maybe other taxi driver won't get to hear the gospel. Then you have taxi driver friends. You get to tell them the gospel. So it doesn't matter what you do, where you are. Do just study and do your best. Don't plot and scheme. Whatever God brings you to is for the purpose of, Vincent, for what? To? What's the meaning of be a good testimony? To declare God's name. Your reason on earth, Christ's prayer for the disciples open and close with this. To make God known to other people. If you are at work and your friends, or you're in school, your friends don't know Christ then you have not fulfilled your purpose. If you are home in your home, your parents also don't know Christ. You have not fulfilled your purpose. Christ prayed for that. Christ prayed for that. <clears throat> Alright, so the purpose of your life is to make people know who the, fa- who the true God is. Who the true God is and not the false God. No, it's like, oh, you know what? Um, be a Christian because uh, God will bless you, will give you health, and you won't ever fall sick. Then you're not declaring the true God. Okay? So now, that, that is what Christ's heart's prayer is. Now, very quickly, question number three. Now, ah, very interesting. Maybe I ask Ellery. Question number three. What did Christ mean in, in verse 19? Let's read verse 19. And... For their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. For their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified through the truth. Right? Declare 
God's name. That people will know God, a good testimony, glorify Him, right? Whether you're capable, not capable, whatever. That. This is the overall purpose. Then, in order to do that, we must live sanctified lives, right? We must live holy lives, correct? We must live holy lives. To live holy lives, Ellery was very important. What's the key that you must know? Know God's word. Alright? If you don't know God's word, very difficult. Now, then Christ said, can you read verse, that, that verse to me? What's the meaning? What is Christ saying? And for their sakes I sanctify myself. What is Christ saying? Any idea? For their sake I sanctify myself. Jesley, what do you think? Okay, very good. Now, Jesley is correct. Now, that's one of the reasons. If Christ's active obedience, Christ obeying the law, sanctifying himself, making himself, keeping himself pure, is for our sake, right? So that he will be the pure, spotless Lamb of God. Then his death will be efficacious for us, correct? So that's correct. So that's one. Um, yes, so that is correct. Now, what are the lessons we learn for ourselves? Joshua, are we called to sanctify ourselves, to die for someone and pay for their sins? Not, right? So what's the lesson we draw for ourselves? We could know God, correct. So now that is Christ. Can we learn something about it ourselves too? Joanne? Joanna? Yes, very good. We see him as an example. Christ set himself apart so that who benefits? We benefit, right? Others benefit. So that's his example. Now that's the same example for us. We must also set ourselves apart. We must also live sanctified and holy lives. You know, for what? For what? For who? Caleb. I must be holy for who? Also for, for God, correct? For God, but for others. For the benefit of others. For the benefit of others. Now, remember, Emily said, Emily said, I have a purpose in this world. Now, Ambilly, in order to fulfill that purpose, you must be sanctified vessel, correct? You must be a pure vessel. And the purpose is for the benefit of others, right? Now, how do you look at your sin? I love to play computer games. I love to watch movies. I love to um, commit this sin, that sin, all right? I just sin, it's okay. It doesn't affect me. I play computer games, I, 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 I commit secret sins, it doesn't affect anybody. Cheryl, is it true? When we commit secret sins or just sin ourselves, it doesn't affect anybody? Is it true? Is it true? What do you think? Elaine, what do you think? How? Say again? God sees also. How does it affect others? But it's secret sin. No one knows. But God knows, correct. God knows. Now, so what if God knows? Back to the same thing. I sanctify myself. Now, don't think that I just live a backslider life. I, I live a worldly life. I just myself. All secret sins, no one knows. When we don't live a holy life, now, um, Emily, if you have secret sins, no one knows. Hmm? Who knows? God knows. Will you be a sanctified vessel? How to draw a sanctified vessel? I don't know. Sanctified vessel. Clean vessel. We won't be, right? We are dirty vessels. Now, will God use a dirty vessel to declare His name, to be, to be useful to Him, to fulfill His purpose? No. No. God wants us to hear. Christ say, 
And Joanna, Joanna rightly pointed out, I sanctify myself that they may be sanctified, that they may benefit. The next time you look at your sin, the next time you and I, or you go back to and say, oh, yeah, should I give up my sins and really now go and, go and live a holy life, serve God, get rid of my sin, be godly like I used to be? What's your motivation? If I, am, if I do that, God will use me, other people will benefit. Do you care? Do you care? Would you give up your sin for the benefit of others? God, I want to be holy. I want to be useful to you. I want, I want, want you, don't you want to be someone who's like that? You're so sanctified, so holy. You keep yourself pure for the Lord. And then the Lord says, Joanna, I heard you start to drive people to church now, right? Then Joanna drives people to church because she, she get rid of her, her sinful way. She said, now I want to live sanctified life for the benefit of others. Won't you want we all want a life? So Joanna driving, then driving a student. Then she preached the gospel to the student. And then God said, ah, Joanna is a sanctified vessel. I'll use Joanna. And then the person, Joanne, then the person got saved. Then the person got saved. Then Joanne said, wow, you know, it's so wonderful to be a sanctified vessel, right? And then you share the gospel or you do things in church, you do something and then God uses it and many souls are blessed. So wonderful. Would you? Christ said, I set myself apart that they may benefit. Don't, don't live thinking that just my sin. No, actually we can be. So Emily, you say I don't want to go to heaven because I have purpose to fulfill. What is the first step you need to fix? We need to fix our sanctification. Then we'll be clean vessel. Then God says, very useful. Very useful. That's why when a, when a believer continues to sin and sin and sin and sin and refuse to repent, what will happen? God will say, no more use for you on earth. Now if you buy a pen, eh? you buy a pen, and the pen refuses to work, you give it many chances. Hey, Ben, work, huh? You work a bit for a while after camp. <laughs> it's like, oh, don't work again. Why you shake, shake, shake? Work. But after again and again and again, say this pen is useless. What do you do? Open the drawer, put it inside, close it. Useless, right? Then you sing, give it another chance. Open the drawer, use again. Still no use. Then you open the waste paper basket cover and you throw it away. Because it's useless. It's useless. Do you want to be useless to God? Why Christ pray this prayer? Why your daddy and mommy want to talk loudly so that you can hear? Because they really hope that it moves your heart. That's why Christ prayed this aloud. And, people rec and he wanted people to record it for us. Because Christ said, I want you to have this life. <laughs> now, then I ask you a very theological question. Theological question. Salvation grace. Um, uh, Vincent. Salvation grace. Salvation grace. What kind of grace is this? Hmm. I know it's a very broad question. Joshua knows the answer. What kind of grace is salvation grace? It's unmerited grace. Unmerited grace, correct. But we describe it in Tulip as what? In Tulip. Brenda, Emily, Jesslyn. Tulip. Say again. It's, it's unconditional, yes. But it is? Go through Tulip. T stands for? T stands for total depravity. U, unconditional election. L, limited atonement. I, irresistible grace. All right. Now, salvation grace is irresistible grace. Correct? Could you resist? Do you remember the day you got saved? You don't to believe. You will still believe. Right? God will ensure that we believe. Right? Irresistible. 
But after salvation, God wants to use you. God wants to use you. And he prayed that God, God prayed that use Brenda, use, use Joash. Now, then he works a work of grace in you. The Holy Spirit began to work. Or after camp, all of us, I want to live for God. You know, the gracious work of God, the God, the Holy Spirit began to work in you and I want to live for God from now onwards. Now, then the Holy Spirit work, work. And then you slowly see the laptop, the computer there again. Then you see your friends going out again. Then, ah, yeah, the Korean movie, next series, out again. Ah, the new movie that is, I don't know, Harry Potter is out again. Then the Holy Spirit began to continue to work the work of grace in you. Be holy, be sanctified, sanctify yourself so that you are a useful vessel that others, that others may be sanctified. Hmm? Then the Holy Spirit worked that grace in you. Is that grace irresistible grace? Is it or not? Vincent? Yeah? Really? <laughs> sure. Means you definitely won't, won't sin. You don't want to believe, also you will believe. So, you don't want to sin, also you won't, also you won't sin. After salvation. So is it irresistible? After salvation, what do you think? It is resistible. God's work of salvation, that grace is irresistible. God will ensure that you will respond. But after salvation, when God works to convict you of sin and to tell you to live this life, He worked that grace is resistible. That's why God gives commands. God said, do this. Do that. Be filled with the Spirit. The only way is to walk in the Spirit. Then you will not resist the work of God. If you walk in the flesh, you will resist the work of God. Understand that? You will choose. After salvation, you must choose. After salvation, God restore that will to choose. God wants us to choose. God will help you when you lean on Him and ask Him to help you, by your own flesh you will fall. So you must remember, when you say, why, uh, why after camp that few weeks, wow, I'm so, so, um, so spiritual, then after a few weeks, mm, deflated, and then go back to my own ways, because initially you receive a lot of the Word. You know why very often after camp you feel spiritually revived? What did Christ give us? The Word, correct? The Word. You get a lot of the Word that one week. The Word works in you. The Word makes you want to depart from sin. The Word makes you sensitive. That's why the Word, God keeps saying, thy, give them, I give you thy Word, thy, your Word will sanctify them. Do you know that if you keep receiving God's Word, it, it sanctifies you, it makes you cleaner. It makes you more sensitive to sin. Then over time, you are not living like you are in camp again. You don't do your devotion, you don't read, you don't, you don't come for fellowship, you don't study God's Word, you don't take FEBC courses, you're not receiving God's Word. Then slowly, slowly, you will begin, the flesh will grow and you begin to resist God's work. Understand that? So, Christian, it is not a mysterious thing. It is simply because we don't want to continue to keep our lives sanctified, that others may be useful. You, would you give up your sin so that, you, so that another, Christ, another person, so that you'll be so useful to God, uh, then other people keep benefiting from God using you? Would you want to be such a Christian? No, this is Christ's prayer for them. Sanctify them. Make them united. Okay? So, what lesson we learn? Give up your sin so that someone else may benefit from God using you. Hmm? Every time you look at that sin, I know Satan's plan. He wants me not to be useful to God. That is his plan. Why he will put that in front of your face? Why he will bring those friends? Why he will, make, he will tempt you with those things again? Because he, doesn't, he wants you to go back to those sins so that you are not useful. This is not what God prays for His disciples. He wants them to be useful. Sanctify them through Thy truth. 
Thy word is truth. Just like me, I set myself apart for their benefit. I also want them to, like Joanne said, follow my example. Follow my example. Okay? Now, next. Let's question four and we're going to go quickly. Question number four. Actually, I think we end here. All right, question four enters into another part of the prayer. So tonight, I just want to summarize. What have we learned about Christ's heart for us? Okay, I summarize on the board for you. Ah, it's all here. Now, what is Christ's prayer for, the, for, for you? That He prayed aloud and wants you to know. Right, Elim and Chloe, what did Christ pray aloud and want you and I to know? And recorded it for eternity for us to read and know. He wants us to, number one, be sanctified. We are sanctified just for, just for, just for, what? Just for fun. I'm sanctified. If I'm sanctified, uh, then God will hear my prayer. Then I pray for A, God will hear, give me A. No. The sanctification is that I will be useful to Him. Why Christ pray for your sanctification? Why give up that sin? Because then I will be useful to declare God's name. That is what He wants. Number two, so God wants us to be set apart from what? Set apart from sin and false teachings. Number two, God wants us to have unity. Have unity means stick to this part. I hope this diagram sticks in your mind uh, after this. I'm trying to pictorialize it for the, for, so it sticks in you. God wants you to be united with this group. If you're attending a church, or you're thinking of attending a church that is here, that is not Christ's prayer for you. Christ wants you to be here. Right? That is what God wants. Separation. So, are you separating from sin? Are you separating from false teachings? Or say, oh, it's okay, or never mind. No, God says, I pray that they will be like that. So why God wants you to stay in this world? The next thing is, He wants your life. How does... You say, how should my life look like on earth? Right, Jaslyn. How, how should my life look like on earth? There was a phrase that Jesus said. Yes? Very good. Yes? Set apart, but... But, you see, how Christ prayed for us not to be taken out of this world. Christ prayed for us not to be taken out of this world. And He said, instead, how does He want our life to look like on this world? Look at your Bible. He said, no, no, go and take them out of this world. Sanctified, correct. Yeah, and what's the purpose of my life on this world? So one is what it looks like, sanctified. Declare his name, okay. Brenda. Serve him. How, why, from, from what do you draw? Which verse? Verse? Anyone help? Every time you wonder, how should my life be? What should I be pursuing? What are my aims? What are my purposes? Now, I look at my life now. The way I'm spending my time, my money, is it right or not? How do I know? Verse what? Verse 18. Shall we read verse 18 together? As even as thou sent me into the world, even so... After Christ said, don't take them out of this world. Don't take Brenda out of this world. God, don't take Jesselyn out of this world. Because I am going to send them to do things. Uh, like Brenda, uh, like um, Emily said, there's purpose. I'm going to send them. God, don't take them out. I'm going to send them. How is He going to send you? Just like how the Father sent Him. Right? So if you ask yourself, am I living my life like how the Father sent Christ? Because I'm not dead, right? As long as you and I are breathing, uh, you're not dead, then we have to ask, am I living like how God sent the Son. When you're playing or comp- when you're going back, you're going to do something tonight, you ask, is this what God sent Jesus to come and do? Then you ask yourself that question. Doesn't mean you don't study, right? You study, why are you studying? 
Jesus also worked. Jesus was a carpenter's son. He also worked. Jesus also walked. Jesus also had to make sure that he uh, worked hard. Right? But his purpose was very clear. Okay? Right? So these few things, I hope we remember. This is what Christ prayed for us. And you say, if our lives are not like that, we are resisting what he prayed for us. Yield. Yield. Then you have a wonderful life. Let us pray. Thank <laughs> you.